This is indeed for all of us a very special occasion and a very, most, very special day. For we are here to welcome and to salute the 20th Secretary of Defense, William S. Cohen, as he takes the helm of our nation's armed forces. And at the same time, for all of us to welcome Janet Langhart Cohen as our new First Lady. Please help me welcome them both. <laughs> Secretary Cohen may be new to the Pentagon, but he's not new to national defense, and he's not new to our men and women in uniform. Far from it. For over two decades, as a congressman and as a senator, he has been one of our country's most expert and most influential legislators. For over two decades, he has wrestled on a daily basis with the challenges and the complexities of protecting our liberty, our prosperity, and our security. For 18 years, he was a leader in the Senate on a vast amount of key legislation for this department, from the Non-Cohen Act that established our Special Operations Command to the passage of the Goldwater-Nichols Act, which has been called the most important defense legislation since World War II. More importantly, William S. Cohen has also been an uncompromising champion of our men and women in uniform and the need to protect their quality of life and that of their families. A champion of the need to keep our forces in a high state of readiness. And a champion of the need to ensure that through, modern, through a prudent modernization, Americans will have tomorrow what we have today, the finest military in the world, bar none. Along the way, he has earned a reputation as a great patriot, one who has never tolerated partisanship in matters of national interest, and one whose judgment on national security spring from only two questions. What is best for America? and what's best for those who defend its liberties. But policy and legislative expertise is not the prime prerequisite for command of America's armed forces. Integrity is. Admiral Stockdale, reflecting on his experience as a POW, concluded that a clear conscience is one's only protection. By that standard, Secretary Cohen will keep us very well protected. I sat with him just two days ago for seven grueling hours of hearings. His former colleagues were reminded once again of what the press already knew. Don't ask Bill Cohen a question unless you really want to hear the answer, the straight answer. And America has prized the Secretary's integrity throughout his long and fruitful career. The great American theologian, Reinhold Niebuhr, said that life has no meaning except in terms of responsibility. By that standard, Bill Cohen has already had a career of great responsibility and a life of great meaning. After two and a half decades in Washington, he could have returned home to his beloved Maine and enjoyed the fruits of his most impressive labors. But this accomplished legislator, lawyer, author, was asked to shoulder new responsibilities, to write a new chapter in our nation's history, a chapter in the Secretary's own words that will carry this department from dealing with one era to shaping the next. This is indeed such a singular moment for our armed forces, for our nation, and indeed for the world. The litany of known problems, after all, is daunting. Our time is a time of volatility, where the new appears to be the only norm. A time of uncertainty, where values are often our only star. 
in a time of danger where instability, turmoil, and aggression still rule parts of our world. But our time is also a time of vast opportunities, a time where technology is bringing us together, a time when freedom and the free market are spreading, and a time where the democracies, both young and old, can marvel in the beauty and in the complexity and in the limitless possibilities of their challenges. And at this moment, this singular moment, America's armed forces require superb leadership. And we are indeed fortunate that Secretary Cohen has agreed to take on this new challenge. Mr. Secretary, the men and women of the United States Armed Forces look forward to standing with you as you chart the new course into the next century. And so, Mr. Secretary Janet, welcome to our family. It is my distinct honor to officially welcome you to the Pentagon as the 20th Secretary of Defense. You come to a department that is strong because it has the best led and finest soldiers, sailors, Marines, and airmen in the world. You come to a department that is at a pivotal moment in its history. We are at peace and secure, but we are entering a new era, an era with a great deal of uncertainty. We know there will be great challenge, and we need great leadership. You have accepted an awesome responsibility to ensure America remains the anchor of security and democratic values in a world of constant change. This unique challenge is to hold fast in terms of what makes us strong today and at the same time to rethink and reshape our forces and strategies for an unknown future. One way to understand this challenge is to recall a pivotal moment in the life of another American patriot and, um, and public servant from Maine, Joshua Chamberlain. Joshua Chamberlain, who is a personal hero of the Secretary, was a Civil War hero. His moment came at Gettysburg when he led his troops in terms of holding Little Round Top, maintaining the high ground, and therefore protecting the Union flank at the critical moment that paved the way to victory. Today, Mr. Secretary, we look to your leadership to hold fast to the high ground that we've gained and to seek even higher ground, higher ground in terms of the quality of our forces and our ready reserves, higher ground in terms of modern equipment, in terms of enhanced and joint capabilities, in terms of sound security policies and bipartisan global engagement. Gaining high ground demands a certain kind of secretary. For today's world, when troops must conduct complex operations using complicated equipment, we need a secretary who understands how to recruit and retrain and retain high-quality people. We need a secretary who understands that attracting such people means we have to provide them with worthwhile careers, with a high quality of life, with a workplace which provides them with dignity and with equal opportunity. We live in an unpredictable world where America's interests can be threatened at any time, anywhere. And so we need a secretary who understands the need to keep the forces at a high state of readiness. We live in a high-tech world where inventions move at blinding speed. And so we need a secretary who understands the need to modernize forces. Bill Cohen is that secretary. In the short time that he's been on board, he's made it very clear that people are his number one priority. And he has already demonstrated his commitment to the dignity of the individual. And he has made it clear and unequivocal that readiness and modernization are top priorities. In today's changing world, we also need a secretary who's willing to take a fresh look at the way we defend America. We didn't need a secretary who's willing to make painful choices to ensure that we have the right forces the right capabilities, and the right strategies for the next century. Finally, in a world that depends on American leadership, we need a secretary who understands that America must be engaged. We need a secretary whose views on American role in the world are not shaped by partisan politics, but from his heart and from his personal values. And once again, 
Bill Cohen is that secretary. He has assumed leadership of the Quadrennial Defense Review. He has welcomed the opportunity to pose the tough questions and drive to the right answers. Throughout his career, he has demonstrated his commitment to American leadership and to forging bipartisan consensus on tough national security issues. A century ago at Little Round Top, Chamberlain was ordered, hold the high ground at all hazards, and he did so. In this decade, in his decade of public service, Bill Cohen has earned the reputation as a man who always tries to seek the high ground. The high ground is the position of vision and the position of strength. That is where America wants to be. And Mr. Secretary, we have confidence that you will lead us there. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the department. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary White, for making me welcome and making this transition into office so seamless and efficient. And uh, thank you, General Shelley Kashvili, for your generous thoughts. High praise from a genuine American hero is both uh, gratifying and humbling. And I want to express my personal welcome here today, of course, to my wife, Janet, uh, the First Lady of the Pentagon, to my sister, Marlene, and her son, Mark, who are here with us, and to my daughter-in-law, Chantel. I welcome uh, all of you here, along with so many friends uh, who are in the audience. Secretary White honors me with his reference to my personal hero and fellow Maynard, Joshua Chamberlain, and his exploits at Gettysburg. It was about a year after the Civil War, having witnessed the Confederate surrender at Appomattox, that Chamberlain struggled to describe the magnitude of the event, asking, what language shall I borrow that can hold the meaning of this hour? And that's my dilemma at this hour. What language shall I borrow to acknowledge the awesome duty that I've accepted to steward the greatest armed forces in the world? First and foremost, I offer you a very simple pledge. I promise to devote every fiber of my being to meeting this challenge. And in so doing, I'm going to call upon every measure of love and support from my colleagues, friends, especially my wife, Janet, and my entire family. I pledge to uphold the confidence that President Clinton has demonstrated by bringing me into his cabinet. The President recognizes that when it comes to national defense, there's an overarching truth that transcends party labels and partisan advantage. That as a global power with global interests to protect, America must maintain the best trained, the best equipped, the most ready, the most capable forces on the globe. That's what we all want. And that's the state of our American forces today. The evidence is here before me in all of you, the men and women standing in rank today. You are the pride of the nation, and you are the envy of the world. And I pledge to earn your trust and to fulfill your expectations. As a member of Congress, it was my duty to employ the power of the purse to support you. And now, as your Secretary of Defense, it's my duty to lead you wisely and always in the cause of peace. This duty is a high privilege, for I am stirred by your dedication and devotion, inspired by your service and sacrifice, and confident in your courage and capability. And so I pledge to defend and protect you as you defend and protect our country. In leading the nation's defense, I will not be acting alone, but serving as a central member of the President's national security team. And to serve this team well, I will draw continuously from the vast reservoir of wisdom and experience of our military leadership, beginning with General Shali Kashvili, the Joint Chiefs, and the Unified Sinks. I'll also be drawing from the wellspring of experience of the civilians at the Department of Defense who support the troops. It is this DOD family, military and civilian, that will ensure that I will provide the Commander-in-Chief with the best possible counsel, advice, and choices. Perhaps the most daunting challenge of all is to live up to the standard that has been set by my predecessor, Secretary Perry, and to build upon his legacy. His stewardship of the Department these past three years came at a critical period in world history in the wake of the Cold War, the third global war of this century. In this post-war period, like those previously, the world often appeared fragmented, inconstant, uncertain, mantled in mist, to quote from W.H. Auden after World War II. And in each of these post-war periods, America has faced a similar challenge, how to create order out of disorder 
to see the world as it was, to imagine the world as it could be, and to set about to narrow the gap between the two. After the First World War, America declined to place its hand on the helm of history. We retreated instead into a cocoon of false security. And soon the world brought another global war to our doorstep, and we paid for it in blood and treasure. After World War II, we chose to stay engaged in the world and responded to the evolving superpower rivalry with the Marshall Plan, the strategy of containment, and the construction of NATO. And they have brought us to the point where we now enjoy this peace. We are just now emerging from the third post-war era, and once again, America is being challenged to create order out of disorder. And today, six years after the Soviet Union's collapse, we see a world where the only constant is change, where threats to American interests can erupt anywhere at any time, where brutal dictators test the world's will to protect the innocent, where closed regimes oppress their citizens and lash out at their neighbors, more eager to dig fresh graves than to bury old hatreds, where rogue states and freelance terrorists can spread fear and death with a truck full of fertilizer, a vial of explosive liquid, or a homemade nuclear device. It's a world that demands American leadership and strong, capable, ready American military forces. But as General Charlie Kashvili indicated, we also see a more hopeful world, a world where America continues to inspire nations to choose the path of freedom and where free markets and free trade pry open closed societies and closed borders, where nations join energy and forces and resources to pursue common causes. And we can also imagine the world that we want, a world where America is secure in peace, where there is more democracy and more cooperation and more stability and fewer weapons in fewer hands. Today, thanks to the work and the imagination of this department, we have the tools to shape the world, the vision, the plans, the strategies, the forces to narrow the gap between where we are and where we need to be. There are still more than 20,000 nuclear weapons in Russia, and our challenge now is to work with Russia to further reduce and safeguard these arsenals. We know how to build a secure and stable Europe, but the Cold War scars haven't completely healed. Our challenge now is to carry on the partnership for peace, to enlarge NATO, to engage Russia, and with our allies to help bring stability to Bosnia. We know how to contain aggression in Southwest Asia, where vital American interests are at stake, but rogue regimes pose a never-ending threat to the oil and the commerce that the industrialized world depends upon. Our challenge is to maintain strong forces in the region and a clear willingness to use them to protect those vital interests. We know that in Asia Pacific, our forward presence and strong alliances are critical to peace in the region and to prosperity here at home. But Cold War thinking persists on the Korean Peninsula. China is a major Pacific power with interests that often overlap and sometimes conflict with our own. America's challenge is to remain a Pacific power, to strengthen our alliance with Japan, to promote the peaceful unification of a free Korea, to beckon China into the family of great and noble nations. And behind all of our policies and programs is our strong, ready, capable military. This, too, we know how to maintain. We've kept the force strong, even as the force is being reduced and reconfigured. We must continue to put people first, to draw and keep the best that America has to offer, and that means providing for a good and decent life for everyone in uniform and for their families. And as the 21st century approaches, you must take a fresh look at how we defend America, to be willing to re-examine our force size and structure and strategy and commitments in light of the changing threats. And our challenge is to sustain the best military in the world under tighter, tighter fiscal constraints Make sure, making sure that every dollar uh, is squeezed into that defense budget. It's a challenge to pursue 21st century military concepts and commercial practices before the 20th century ends. This is an hour of greatness for our nation. It's an hour that's been gained by the trials and triumphs of the past, an hour focused on the possibilities and portents of the future. And as Joshua Chamberlain asked in his day, what language can we borrow that can hold the meaning of this hour? Let me borrow the words of Winston Churchill uh, at a dinner he once hosted for one of our finest American journalists, Stuart Alsop. 
After dinner, having indulged in some, some champagne, and I suspect a little bit of brandy, Churchill said, America, America, a great and powerful country, like some strong horse pulling the rest of the world up out of the slough of despond towards peace and prosperity. But will it stay the course? And then he fixed his cold blue eyes accusingly on Alsip, and he said, again, will America stay the course? Well, nearly 50 years later, we can answer his question. America has stayed the course because that is our responsibility and our duty. And America will stay the course because that's our destiny. Last month, in saying farewell to Bill Perry, President Clinton, he said that the measure of success for the Secretary of Defense is a military stronger and a nation safer than when he took office. Secretary Perry exceeded that measure, and that measure is now mine to meet. And I pledge to you today and to the American people that I intend to do everything in my power to do so. Thank you very much.